Okay. Okay, so um, like I said this night, because there is a full video already, this is just going to be kind of an introduction to Agile estimation and not a, a full-fledged um, in-depth um, training on it, okay? So for the purpose of the training we have this night, we'll be looking at the meaning of estimation. We'll be looking at the different level of estimation in the project development. We'll look at estimation approach. We'll look at estimation techniques. We'll look at factors that affect estimation process. We'll look at the rules of team members during estimation. What do everybody do during estimation? The time of estimation and some challenges that you would would definitely have, you know, when it comes to um estimation. Okay. All right. So what do we mean by estimation? Okay, estimation simply means the process of predicting or guessing what is required to complete a task in terms of the amount of time or effort or resources that needed to uh, be put in place, you know. And to do this, you make use of available information um, and knowledge to make an educated guess, you know, about what it will take to accomplish a particular task for uh, you, you have um, your experience also impacts your estimation. Okay, so and estimation is um, is important and it cuts across every phase of um, of of a phase of life and work. Okay, so as human being, we make you carry out estimation daily. You look at you know there are times when you plan oh I need to do this and this and this and this before the end of today. That is you. Uh, doing kind of looking at an estimation and saying mm, roughly I should be able to you know do this and this and this let's assume you want to go somewhere and you need to jump on the train to get to where you're going to the appoint your appointment is maybe by let's say 12 o'clock you're looking okay I'm like roughly how many minutes is it going to get take me to get there even now I know there are apps that tells you or you're going to get there in 22 minutes you won't you won't leave home 22 minutes to 10 you will be able to factor in that like, anything can happen on the way you know you will factor that in and if, if that journey is going to take you something like 22 minutes to get there you might decide to give it roughly perfect buffer in and give it roughly 40 minutes leave home 40 minutes before the time so that you can get there on time why do you have to leave on 40 minutes? There are some factors, unknown factors, you know, that you've put in place. That, okay, anything can happen on the way and things like that and everything. And then you don't even start getting ready from home by 40 minutes to uh, to 10 o'clock. You will have started getting ready maybe to 9, do what you need to do, pack the things you need to take for the appointment, make sure everything is ready and all that before you before you now set out putting the you know the distance and everything into place. That's estimation. So we do estimation daily. Everyone does estimation daily. We 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 do estimation daily in everything you do. You're traveling and everything you put. You know those are things you put in place when you're traveling and everything. You're going for summer holiday before the uh, the children resumes and everything. You won't use the whole six weeks of their holiday. This all six weeks to to go on the holiday. You look at a situation where oh, we need to come back on time. Maybe just do four weeks so that they still have time to rest. You still have time to you know prepare for them resuming back to school and everything. You have time to rest before you go back to work and all that. Those are estimations that you put in place. So we do it every single day in everything we do. We estimate in everything we do. There's nobody that is absolute to say, oh, exactly one hour, that is when I'm able to, you know, do this and that and everything and all that. It, it, it's just an estimate and everything. There are times when you, like I said, you decide, oh, these are the things I want to do in detail. You write 10 things down and everything. You might end up going through just three or four of them, not able to go through, you know, everything and all that. So those are the things you want to do. You've estimated that, okay, these are the things I want to do and everything. But actually you might not, you know, um, with the, but as time goes on and you start putting those plans in place that, okay, I want to do four things. And you know that, okay, the last time I said I wanted to do these 10 things, I ended up doing maybe three of them. If I want to do the same 10 things again, another time and everything, there's some things you will put in place that you've noticed when you did it the first time that will help your estimation going forward now to, you know, to be 
better and that is you you know the experience that you've put in the fact that you've gone through a similar thing before will help your estimation to get better so simply estimation is just you the process of you predicting or guessing uh, what you what will be required you know in order for you to be able to accomplish a particular task let me put it that way now estimation in project development refers to the process of predicting the resources the time the cost required to complete a software project, you know, a lot of things. So estimation in project development is not just limited to story estimation. Estimation starts from the beginning, from initiation of that project. You start having estimation, you know, in place, okay? So let's look at levels of estimation now in, in a project um, uh, development. Like I said, you have the initial estimation from initiation. That is when they are planning it. Uh, this project, what 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 is the solution? Uh, roughly, what is the timeline? Okay, so you can decide to say that oh, for this project, it's going to be a three months timeline. By the time you get to execution and all that, you might be looking at the situation. Stakeholders might be looking at the situation whereby it's going to take more than that three months. You know, but roughly that is what they want. They want to put it at the minimum timeline. Okay, not that they they might have put a a, a strategy in place whereby they want that project to go live in a, a, a year's time, in, in 12 months' time. But by the time they are coming to you, they're not going to give you all the 12 months. They're not going to give you the development team all the 12 months. So they're going to give you maybe roughly, let's say, three months or six months because they needed the remaining six months to do some things. Marketing is still there, you know. Some regulations, compliance are still there that they need to meet and everything and all that. So they put they put that buffer in. So from the from the onset of the project, from the initiation stage of the project, they, they are estimation in place. You have estimation, you know, they have high level estimation when they are planning, you know, all the projects. There's a high level estimation in place. Like I said, the timeline. They look at the tools. They look at facilities. What are the resources? You know that we need. We need to use the cost. What is the scope? How big is this project going to be? And they, they, all those things help them to give an estimate proper when they're looking at the size. The size depends on the duration, okay? And that depends on uh, what what is our scope for this project? Where do we want to stop? Because creativity, I tell you, runs wild. And you you have to look at your budget in order to 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 put your uh, scope in a frame, kind of to say, okay, for now, this is what we need to spend, and this is where we think it's gonna cover. So going forward and everything, when money starts coming in from this particular product, we can now update it better. We can now upgrade it, but for now, at least to get it out, this is the timeline we have in place, and this is the whole scope we have in place. This is what we want it to meet at this particular time, then you're looking at your resources, your budget and your resources. Your resources is not uh, limited to just human resources. You'll have the technical resources also, the tools that you're going to give to the human resources, you know, to be able to work, work with, the subscriptions you're going to make with third parties in order to use some of their apps to, to achieve what you want to do. All those things you put in at the, at the planning stage. And is is an estimate. It's not absolute. It's not that oh, exactly this is the way it's going to be because you know software projects are all uh, uh, complex and uncertain. You have uncertain uncertainties in it. And then when you get to the execution level now, that's the level where the story point aspect and everything comes in. So your estimation right there has become low level. You know, like I said, the planning one is high level. So you're not going to the nitty gritty and everything. Yet the budget will be drawn by either the uh, finance department or the accountant and things like that and everything. But you don't go to the nitty gritty. You just said, okay, roughly we'll have about roughly three million, you know, pounds for this project. You know, they're not saying we have um um two million uh one hundred and fifty thousand all the way to the penny. That would have been absolute. But they just, you know, giving it a run field, approximating it. So it's an estimate. It's, it's not, it's at the end of the whole project. By the time they now start, you know, calculating, having a breakdown of what they spend and everything, that's when they will have it to the to the last penny. But right at the beginning, they just have a whole, you know, uh, figure. Okay, so at execution stage, you have, you have the low level estimates, you know, for the process of implementing the tax that that uh, that will help you to achieve the project goal. Here you focus more on the, the resources, human resources, 
the tools, the experience, the knowledge, and the skills of the people you're bringing on board. Because I tell you, when you look at the skills and the experience of your resources, human resources in this stage, it helps you to know. Um, so if you have a project where I want this project to be run within six months, you have a client that has come and wants a project to be run within six months. Within six months, you want to take your best staff your your best you know developers your best uh keyways your best small masters to do it because you have a limited time the time is so limited and you don't want to it's a client you want to deliver to target and you don't want a situation where you put somebody in that you still need to be training and all that and all those times that you're using to do that is affecting the time that the, the the client wants the project to be released so your execution estimation is as i said is low level you can't have it high level to say, oh, we just get three developers. What is the, this? that's where you now start looking at the skills of those developers. That's when by the time you go into interview, they, that's where they um, source for resources, human resources. If they don't have enough in the organization and they need to get somebody from outside to do it, they really want to know what you know. They really want to know where you are. They want somebody that will get on and start working. They don't want somebody that they would have to now start sending on trainings and this and that. They don't want that in place. Okay, so it's low level at that stage. And that's the stage also where your story, you know, where you now become the team, uh, member of the, um, sorry, the team and everything. You start your planning. The business analyst has written the story and everything. You want to get an understanding of that story and you want to size it up. That is where your story point estimation comes in. That is where your um, estimation in hours comes in on your task when you are in sprint, where that team member, particular team member that is good, developer that is going to work on it is able to look at it and said, okay, based on, you know, my experience and my skill, if I have to, de uh, if I have to develop these and go through these using this application, what application are they using? Is it web application? Is, is, sorry, not web application. Are they using uh, um, um, a PHP? Is it, are they using HTML? You know, those are the, the things that the developer wants to know. What are they using? Am I going to start writing and generating code? Or are we using a web application that has been uh, um, um, updated, has a template already, and we're just getting the template and then customizing that template to what we have and all that. Those are the things that the developers will look at You know, when they are estimating the story. And that is part of the things that will help them. So estimation, well, that's another level of estimation. And then you have estimation at review stage. And this is when you combine your high level estimation from planning and the low level estimation you have during execution in order to have a revised estimate. So your high level estimation at planning combined to your low level estimation um, during execution, you will be able to, at the review stage, you should be able to um, now have um, a revised estimate. I will explain what that stage is for you. So the, the initial plan and everything has been done. The execution part has been done. We've created, we've released um, that thing and it has been deployed either to pre-production or production. Pre-production is um, an environment. Okay, so uh, maybe quickly, let me just explain what I meant by that. So when your developers and testers are working, you have a developer's environment. That is the environment where the developer carries out what they need to do. All the development work they need to do is done at the develop uh, develop environment. So once they finish developing a development environment, they push what they've done into the test environment. So what the developer is seeing on a developer's environment is different, totally different from what a tester is seeing on their own environment. Okay. With the developer's environment, all their tools are there for them to just use and do what they need to do. When it's common, it's what when what has been developed is pushed to the um, test environment, you're not able to see that. Your test environment is not the same, but a bit closer to the uh, kind of production environment, but it's not the same. So what you're seeing there, what you're testing there is this is what the user would see when we push to, you know, pre-prod or prod. Pre-prod means pre-production and then prod means production. 
and all that. So they do their testing on that. They're able to raise their box. That's where they run their automation on also set up their automation framework and everything. And then once that is done, you know, we have a UAT. Right now, the BAs are working on the test environment as the UAT. But in organizations out there, there is actually a UAT environment. The UAT environment mimics the production or life. It's called either production or life environment, mimics the production environment. And what you have on UAT at times is not even, you have situations where not even the PO or the, um, uh, what is it called? The BA are the ones carrying out that test. That test is being carried out by the user stakeholders. When I mean user now, okay, let's use an example of you're creating an app now for NHS. Your user, the people that will do U, yeah, UAT on it most times might be maybe the doctors that are going to use those, that app. If it is going to be the nurses that are going to use that app, they will be the one. If it is an app where, you know, you go to hospitals now and everything, you don't need to hold your paper or go to the reception and say, oh, I have an appointment for so, 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 so time. In big um, teaching hospitals now, there's an app by the door that you just go and you key in everything that you need to do, you know onto it and everything. This is my appointment time. I'm seeing so, so, so person. I'm seeing that, 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 that. You see all those things when they are in the UAT environment, either the doctors or the nurses would come there and be like the user, be like the patient to test it because they know what they want the patient, patients to be able to do on that app. So they will be the one carrying out the user acceptance test and then they're able to give feedback on that one. Again, because this is an internship, Okay, and then what you have, we don't have end users or stakeholders here. That's why your PO is at times does the UAT or delegate it to the BA to do because the BA or the PO then is representing the user in order to do that. Okay, so that's what you have. So at review, that's when you look at, okay, so this is what we planned. This was our plan. This is our goal. This is our expectation. And this is what you have done and everything and all that. And the review is, like I said, on UAT. And then they're able to give feedback. And then on your feedback, you adjust. That is when you now have a revised estimate. And you're looking at, okay, so we've been able to do this and that. Uh, what, what, what would it um, uh, reflect to? So you know you have review meeting also as one of your scrum event so you've done what you needed to do yeah on your own environment and everything you demo it to the stakeholders at your review meeting and everything they are able to look at it and then they are thinking okay this is our expectation that's the high level estimate and then they look at the low level estimate this and this and this and this is what you've put in place in order to meet that estimate um uh, expectation did it meet it? Yes, that's fine. It's sorted. Uh, yeah, it met it, but um, we we'll still want you to, you know, do this. We, I'd rather have more content, you know, instead of a static um back um um uh, landing page banner. I prefer a moving landing page banner you know uh, and then when they say moving is it the one that is sliding from left to right is it the one that is um how do they put it transitioning you know flowing from one image to the other and all that th th that's the review aspect coming in and then you're able to give an estimate because they wanted that thing to go live at the end of the sprint isn't it but because of the adjustments that needed to be done you now make an estimate to say okay for us to do this re uh, review you know to do this adjustment and all that can we have it done in the middle of the next sprint so they don't want it to get to the end of the next sprint they just want use roughly a week to revise what you need to do and everything and once that revision is done the PO, not the whole thing, needs to go back to that stakeholder. The PO can just go back to say, oh, can you have a look now? We've done what you want. Oh, yeah, perfect. This is what I wanted and everything. And before the end of the sprint where you did that, even though you've taken the story to done, that is deployed, you know, to life for uh, users to be, if it's a project that is live already and then you're just, you know, upgrading. If it's a project that is not live yet and everything, that is, you know, kind of deployed into uh, what has been done. That increment, that incremental value has been added and then you move on with all the other things that you need to do so you have these different levels of estimation during yeah the sprint during not the sprint but even the project life cycle you have it all through and then you have it during the sprint because during your sprint you plan you execute when the work is really carried out and then you have a review just as you have planning execute and review during, during a sprint is also um it also you also have it also 
in the project life circle also. Okay. All right. Um, and then for the purpose of tonight's um teaching, we'll be focusing more on the execution stage. You know, where that's where we have our story points and all that. So that is the one that we'll be focusing much more during this um the course of tonight. Okay. Um, so that we look at efforts that is required in completing particular um user stories. So we'll be doing that. Okay, so we want to look at estimation approach. There are different approaches to how you estimate um, 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 a story or get your story points in place. And those are the things that we want to look at. And I said there are different estimation, uh, agile estimation approach that can be used, okay? And they are designed to be flexible. It's not concrete, you know, it's not cast in stones. They are designed to be flexible. They're designed to be adaptable. Uh, they are designed to be collaborative so that, you know, the teams are able to quickly and accurately estimate work that needs to be done. Adjustments are done to during estimates, you know, as they progress through the project. And when you do, adjust, when I mean adjustment is a situation where if I'm estimating for the first time, and I put maybe all my estimation that I did, I just do 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, because it's new to me, isn't it? It's not something I've done before. So my first sprint, I might do 13, 13, 13 and all that. By the time I'm coming to second sprint, I won't estimate 13 anymore because I've learned how to estimate. I've had a, a, a feel. I've had that experience of estimating. I've been on the environment to do it. I know now what to do. So I might not have a full-fledged, uh, information or uh, confidence in it, but I won't do it 13 anymore. Maybe I will do it or an eight or a five this time around, and then it keeps getting better and better and better. So that doesn't mean even when I'm a pro at um, estimating, I say, oh, because I'm a pro now, I'll give it a one. There's a lot of things to be considered when you're doing an estimation. Okay, so for estimation approach, you have um, relative estimation. Okay, and this is an approach that involves um estimating the size or complexity of each user story relative to other user stories i'll give example of that so you have two stories to estimate you have a register story to estimate you have a login story to estimate you're able to compare them you know look compare the two of them together and then be able to decide okay so Definitely, registration takes a longer process. I have to fill a form. The form you have to fill has a lot of things in it. And when after filling the form, I will wait for a confirmation email to come. And when the confirmation email come, I will have to, you know, uh, click on the confirmation email for verification and all that. So the, the 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 volume of what you need to do is much, and there will be some complexities in there. What if I don't get the email on time? Or oh, I press it, I submitted, it wasn't going. You know, my system is slow and is affecting. Different thing, com com complexity like that is different from when you want to log in. You've registered already. The system has um, recognized the your reg your username or your email already. So when you want to log in, all you do is you put your username or your email in, you put your password in, and then you're able to log in. Okay, so you're able to compare two stories together in order for you to be able to estimate. So the estimate you give a log a register story definitely won't be the story the, the same um estimate you give a login story because you're able to compare them together. That is what your um that is what you do with your um, relative um, estimation, okay? So you have a situation where, like I said, a higher story gets more story points because it's more complex than one with a lower um, um, a lower uh, a story, which is no more complex. The best one I can use is just register and login, you know, to give us. So another one you have, another estimation approach you have is a planning poker approach. So for planning poker approach is a consensus based estimation technique where you know team members use playing cards. Uh, I, I, I won't say everybody knows what playing a poker is because it's not everybody that plays poker. I guess I even understand a bit of the game more when I started doing planning poker as an estimation. Okay. So this is a situation where you use cards to assign story points to each of the user story. 
and then each team member selects a card that represents their estimation and then the cards are revealed simultaneously so initially when you're picking that card nobody knows about it nobody knows what you pick and then everything is revealed at the same time okay and at this point the team members now discuss or the ones that have yeah now discuss the the individual estimate and comes to a consensus on the final estimate and that was that's one you're using and that's what you're doing at, at your sprint planning that's when everybody you know um give their estimate and then you're looking at different numbers and that is where you come in as a scrum master to facilitate that discussion okay to so say that okay um Daniel, why did you choose a five? Oh, I picked a five because it tells us the reason why you picked a five. And most times by the time they are calling me yeah, and I've picked an eight, I'm saying, ah, I didn't see it from where what where Daniel has uh where Daniel is coming from. I picked an eight because of da 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 da. But looking at what Daniel said now, okay, I have a uh, I think I have a better understanding. I would come down to a five also because i think daniel is right or it might be daniel that says oh i'm not seeing it from the point moji has made i think i'll go up to an eight i didn't know we had to do you know automation i didn't know we have we're going to end up doing api or they are asking those questions when they are doing the clarification already from the ba to say that are we going to do api on this one and everything and all the po also and then they are asking again or oh, um this is just view isn't it we don't need to click on anything because you know when you click, you don't worry. By the time you start working with your developers and your testers, you understand some of these things because I didn't understand it initially. Also, that when you click, it means uh, you you have to run an automation when you click and uh, and something happens. There's a, an action to you clicking something different from when you just get on the page and you observe. That is, uh, you view a form. That one might just be a straightforward, just manual test and doesn't need an automation. And all these things affect, you know, so the consensus comes where you understand what the other person is able to um, able to explain to you. And then you make changes, you know, to your estimation based on that fact. OK, so that that is another approach to estimation. To, to do your estimation and then you have the t-shirt sizing approach and this is both assigning a size or a category to each story based on its relative complexity for example a user story may be assigned a small uh, a size of small a size of medium large you know depending on the amount of effort required to be able to um, complete what needed to be done, okay? So that one is um, T-shirt sizing. So quickly, I'll just quickly go back to um, relative, um, the relative, uh, what is it called? The relative um, estimation one. So for relative estimation, one of the techniques that you can use there is Fibonacci. Actually, the, one of the techniques that you can use for all the approach, you can use Fibonacci um, um, sequence is, is a technique. So this one's at the approach and then Fibonacci sequence falls under um, um, technique. And there are times when you merge an approach and a technique together in order to run your estimation. Like you can merge your planning program, which is an approach, and then use the technique, Fibonacci sequence technique, in order to do the estimation that is needed, where you're looking at, you know, reaching the consensus. And uh, so relative um, estimation also, you can merge it with um, um, Fibonacci sequence, which is a technique, and then be able to run that. There is it even possible that you merge your relative estimation with your planning poker and use a um, Fibonacci sequence as a technique in order to get to your estimation. It's all about what suits the team, what suits the projects that you're working on, and the level of experience and exposure of the people that are doing the estimation. Okay, and then the last one there, the, it, this is, these are not just the four approaches you have. I'll just pick this four out for the, the purpose of this course. So you have the affinity mapping also. This approach involves grouping user stories together based on their similarity or common themes. So you want to, th those are the ones that are done maybe on the feature. So you have a feature that talks about authentication. You know that registration is under authentication, forgotten password is there, login is there, you know, anything that has to do with security and everything, you group them together and then you are running your estimation based on the group that they, uh, the, 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 the grouping that you've done on those ones. So um, that is what you do, you know, uh, on that one, okay? Uh, like I said, for the purpose of this training, we'll be looking at um, relative estimation, 
we'll look at um, planning poker out of the approach that we need to look at, like I said, you can combine them together in order to be able to run your estimation and get um, a better uh, point in place. Okay, so uh, for relative estimation, okay, your relative estimation is an approach that estimates by a way, which I've explained before, of comparing the size of complexity of two user stories together in order for you to, that, so that it can help you to estimate uh, better. And like I said, you can use the technique, the Fibonacci sequence technique. You can use the T-shirt size, and that's another technique, you know, the uh, extra small, small, medium, large, extra large, and then some other similar techniques that goes, you know, that suit what you're doing and that goes along with it. Um, okay, uh, quickly before we leave that, I just want to say that um, um, an example there is, let's use an example, um, the unit measure of, of a story points you will assign to, uh, you have a story where um, so, uh, somebody, I'm, I, I don't want to go to the technical, so just to give you a, a better um, kind of description. So you have a story where somebody is carrying water up the the stairs, you know, and then you have another one where somebody is carrying water in a cup up the stairs. That's the first one. And then somebody is uh, carrying water up the stairs in a bucket and they are saying assign story points to them. Definitely they're going to be different. The, the, the effort is going to, is going to take you to, just carry a cup with, of water and go up the stairs. It's definitely going to be different from the effort you will use carrying, you know, a bucket of water up the stairs. At the same time, somebody else, somebody else can put in the, oh, for the first one where car, I carry a cup of water, oh, that's, that's going, it won't take me much effort and everything. So I just give it a two. And then I'll give the one for the bucket a, maybe a three. And then you can have somebody else looking at it from another point of view view to say it's easier for you to carry a bucket of water up the stairs than carrying a cup of water up the stairs because if you're too fast you will spill everything in the cup so it might take you walking slowly you know with a cup of water in your hand going up the stairs than you would be when you're carrying a bucket of water which you've balanced very well in your hand up the stairs so experience exposure uh, level of understanding all comes in when people are um, estimating Okay, so I just quickly want to use that as an example when you're talking about relative um, size and what you compare together when you're doing that. Okay, and then we go to planning poker. And planning poker is, a, like I said earlier, is a conscientious based estimation approach where the team members use playing cards to assign story point to each other. Okay. And like I said, each team member anonymously selects a card that represents their estimate, and the cards are revealed simultaneously. Once everyone, you know, participating have selected their cards, the team then discusses their individual estimate, and then they come to a consensus on a final estimate. We have a situation where at times, um. Uh, some teams do it differently. Some just do it, uh, discuss it, and verbally they said, "Oh, okay, I, 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 I'm, I'm coming down or up to, you know, your level and all that because now I understand." So they change their estimate. You have like planning poker allows you to change your estimate if it has been set up like that. You're able to change your estimate and everything, and then the team has a consensus. You know, unanimously agree on a number going. And however, I know Laomi has explained to you also that in the situations where um, you do have people not reaching the same consensus and all that, don't be alarmed about it. You know, we all have our different uh, reasoning and understanding to a thing. And that's why the average, uh, uh, reach, um, reaching your um, estimation by average, adding all the numbers together, divided by the number of the people that does the vote and if it's to reach an average, and then your average determines where you're falling to, where it is in a decimal, is it on the higher side, you move to the next uh, Fibonacci number, and if it's on the lower, you move to, you know, you come down to the previous Fibonacci number, okay, so you can do your um, estimation like that and just reach an agreement that way, okay, so now we want to go into uh, Fibonacci's sequence. So this is what you have in Fibonacci scan. It's a technique, like I said, that involves assigning user story with a unit of measure. 
based on a sequence, okay? So your, the, these numbers are just units. They represent units of measure, okay? And then uh, what you're looking at, the, the smallest unit there is one. And then the next one is two. Who can tell me why you have a two after a one? How, what did they do to get that two? One plus one. one plus one, good. So with Fibonacci sequence, what you do is you add the previous two number. For the first one, you double the, the first number to get two, and then you add up the previous two numbers to get the next number. So you add one and two together to get your three. You add two and three together to get your four. And what that is saying is that it's going to take me um, an effort of one and two to be able to do this. So if you if you look at what they've done, they've represented the numbers with a unit of block. So the first one is just one block. And by the time I'm picking two, I'm saying that I'm going to do, I'm going to use double what I use for a one in order to be able to do it too. When you get to three, you're going to you're saying that I'm going to add the effort I use for a story that I've done done one on and two on in order for me to be able to do a three and it goes on like that. Okay, so something gets to a stage, it gets to a stage well with experience and all that. And part of your team charter, you've put it there to say that any story that is bigger than eight, we need to break it. It's too big. You can't, it can't be taken as one story. It needs to be broken down further, okay? And that is why you size up your story and you do estimation during refinement because you don't want to be breaking those stories down during sprint planning. You want to do it during your refinement. So your BA write, reads a story for you uh, during refinement. Everybody has a shared understanding. And then you're asking the developer and the tester to say, okay, can you uh, please just roughly estimate this story? And then they, they did an estimate on that story and almost all of them are coming to a 13. Okay, so a 13 is too big a story to go. So maybe the, the BA has, um, has um, how will I put it, put two things together to be done on that story. So it could be, let's, let me give an example. It could be you have a situation where they've put a login. This wouldn't be it, but just an example. A login and... um um forgotten password they put it on one story and then the the developer and or especially the, the kiwis are looking at it to say that okay so by the time i finish testing the login aspect you want me to test or oh, they can put let's put uh on that login they've put that login scenario in they put this scenario of a uh, click checkbox to remind uh to remember you know, when I log in again and then they put forgotten password, they put all those three um, scenarios together on one story. So the testers are going to look at it and say, okay, so I'll finish this aspect first and then I'll go back again, you know, to test the, the checkbox that I've done for remember, remember my login details and everything. And then they're going to come back again, click on forgotten password. And they would, if they estimate a, a 13 to it, then that story needs to be broken down. Further. So it could be broken down to two to have just login and remember my login details to be one story and then forgotten password to be another story entirely because it has its own process, which is quite different. So that's how you break down stories when they are too big and then be Hello. able to look at it and agree together as a team to do that. Yes. Do I have somebody asking a question? Yes, we need help in the DA room. We have finished our class, but the person, Wumi is not, she's there, but I guess she's not listening to it, so she doesn't know the training is ended, and we hi, need someone to stop the recording. Hi, hi, yes. hi. Oh, um, hi. My laptop is recording for the DAs. Is it DA you're calling me for? Yes, we finished. We just need someone to end the recording, so it doesn't thank just keep going. I appreciate going. that. Don't worry. Yes. I'll do that right away. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, guys, she's coming. All right, sorry about that. Um, okay, so where were we? Okay, so we're talking about Fibonacci sequence. Okay, so and you can see for um this chart also, some teams will carry 13 in, okay, Dep depending on their level of uh, performance. Depending on their level of performance, some teams will take this in. That's why you are seeing this still in blue. And then you can see there's 21 in red. So for them, 21 is a no go to, to pick as an estimate. That story needs to be broken down. That is what that red is showing here. So for your team, it could be that your red starts from 13. You believe any story that is 
13, you know, it's just too big a story. It needs to be broken down. You know, maybe two, like I said, two features or two functionalities have been put together on a particular story. And the developer might be able to do it and everything is fine. But the testers will feel that, okay, so that's journey. I need to end one journey in order to test the next journey. And as a result, they'd rather have the story broken down into two rather than having it as a one. Okay, that's your Fibonacci sequence. Um, okay, so we want to look at estimation determinants. What determines the number that you pick? What are those factors that, you know, influences the number that team members pick when they are doing their estimation? You have complexity, you have effort, you have risk, you have dependencies, you have size, and then you have domain knowledge also. These are, are some of the things, or this I can say roughly maybe the main things that affects, um, um, the numbers that the person that is doing the estimation needs to consider, you know, before they pick the number. And they, like I said, they have, they influence the story points um, that a person is picking for the estimation. So we're just going to look at them quickly, one after the other. Okay. Um, bear with me. I don't know where my slide is now. Okay. All right. We will do that. We would, okay. So, uh, sorry, let me quickly go back to that. Actually, I thought I had it down. Bear with me. Okay, so under complexity, what you're looking at, yeah, this this is a key factor, you know, during story estimation. Okay, if if a user story is more complex, it's likely to require more effort, you know, to complete it, and therefore maybe maybe assigned a higher story point value. When you're looking at complexity, you're looking at situation where um. Some investigation needs to be carried out on the maybe the developer's environment or the the yeah mainly on the developer's environment and even the testers might need to do it. So it might be um kind of um um a technical it's something that is technical kind of for them to do. It might be you might have a situation in place where they have a feature where um um a feature that is trying to uh, let me see allow end users to create, let's say, for example, you have a website and um, you want users to be able to, um, let me use an example of um, Facebook. Yeah, Facebook, even though now to users is very easy, is user friendly. I jump on it, you know, I post some, what I need to post. I do this and that and everything. But look at the complexity that will be in place for the people that actually developed it. You have a, a, a page that is down to me. I can post things on it. I can post my videos there. I can post my uh, my comments there. I can link it to another website. I can actually put a link on Facebook for you to link another website that I have, another uh, blog or something that I have, and people are able to go there. So, But look at the complexity that would be put in place for the team to be able to do that. In a situation where you can link um, another website uh or another yeah another website or another platform from your facebook we're talking about api had to be put in api for the the developer api testing also for the the testers that are going to run a test on it most times you might need another one like that is the the multiple payment gateways so you have a website, maybe all these retail websites and all that. You can either make payments directly or you can pay through play, PayPal. You can pay through Klarna. If you click on PayPal, you have to, it has to redirect you to the PayPal, uh, sorry, um, PayPal platform. And that is you connecting, you know, another website, another payment gateway to your website, having multiple gateway payments. To your, that's complex. For the people that have developed it, for me using it, I just click on something and it takes me there. I'm enjoying it, but for the development team, it's it's a complexity that they need to work in place. They, they have to look at security wise, especially when it comes to people's money. You have to be careful. You have to look at things that have to do with the security aspect of things, tighten security, have a service level agreement with PayPal before you can use that app on your platform, you know, all those complexities need to be put in place. So definitely a story that comes with that would have, uh, you know, a higher, would would you, is a factor that will bring about a higher number. 
to that story. So that's an example. When it comes to effort, the amount of effort required to complete a user story, you know, that's another point that you need to consider when you're doing your estimation. Okay, so if a user story is expected to take more effort to complete, yeah, it may be assigned a higher um, a user story. When I say more effort to complete, it might be because of um, uh, uh, if, um, anything. It could be because of the complexity, it could be because of the size, the volume, what needs to be done. You know, while I was ex using an example of registration and login um, at the earlier on and everything, you look at the effort it's going to take me, you know, to fill a form and everything. And then login is just, you know, it's just two fields. I know that most times, even when you do remember me for login, when you go to log into the account next time, you don't even need to type anything in because, you know, you've said remember me is there. All you click is just login or sign in. Or, uh, yeah, sign in, and then it just takes you in into your account and everything. But look at I've I've run away from a lot of websites where I I like what I'm seeing there, but you know I just can't be bothered to to register and everything. And because of that, I just move because the effort you need to do that. That's for me as a user. Now look at the effort that has been put in by the people that are going to develop it or test it. There will be some mandatory fields. They will expect the first name and last name to be mandatory. You know, the email is mandatory. It should not be more than 10 characters. Your first name should not be more than 20 characters. Your da, 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 da. Those are efforts that need to be put in place in order to do that. So a, 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 a team member or team members estimating a registration looks at the effort, everything we need to check and everything. The testers will have to do both um, positive and negative tests. So what if I put less number? Is it going to allow it? And if it allows it, then that talks about the security. You know, when you're talking about registration and logging, you're talking about security. If it allows it in in um, contrast to what has been put in the acceptance criteria, you know, that comes into place. So for, um, for logging, they can do both um, positive and negative tests for a login, but the, the effort needed is quite low for login, you know, because it doesn't have many fields that you need to fill and all that. So that's the effort aspect. And then you're looking at the risk also. What is the risk involved in, in this particular user story? And that also influences what you estimate for that user story. So if a user story has a very high level of risk, like I'm talking about the, the payment gateways, they have high level of risk. You have to secure people's money. You know, you have to be careful so that hackers don't go there and easily be able to um, um, break your encryp encryption and all that and then get into people's accounts. That is on your website. So you've got to be careful. You know, you have to look at those risks. What are those risks that is involved in us, you know, creating this user story or testing this user story? And that allows you, you know, to be able to put in a higher number when you're doing the estimation for it. You know, you, you value the account for all the additional efforts, all the resources that is needed to, that is required in order to mitigate that, um, that risk that you've seen. So remember, a risk is an issue that has not happened yet. So you want to consider it before it happens and all that. So you're looking at the risk, what is the risk involved in us developing this particular um, particular feature that they want uh, the, the organization or the client wants us to develop and everything. Look at the risk. How do we mitigate it? What is the plan that we've put in place that in case it happens, this and this and this also is what needs to, be hap to, to happen and everything. And that is factored into your estimation. I don't know the risk that I'm going to meet when I'm doing it. Especially, let's, again, I go back to payment gateways. I don't know the risk that is involved in doing this and all that and everything. I don't want to factor that in place when I'm doing my estimation. Okay, so that could give your estimation a high, a higher number. So also is dependencies. Okay, so dependencies is another a, a factor. If a user story is dependent on another user story, or an, an external factor, say for instance, there's a story we need to work on, and we need data. You know, for us to work on this story, we need data to be included on the on the on the platform and everything like that okay so even if the data has been provided the developer can give a higher estimation to that particular story because they don't know what they will meet with the data am i able to easily put the data on will it go on or will it come up with or oh, is too big it needed to it needs to be broken down further and everything and because of that i'm going back you know to the to the stakeholders to say we need to break this down further 
okay in order for us to accommodate it so do you want to reward it so that it comes um, it comes little because we can only put so 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 amount or you're requesting for the data to be put on and everything and then you have a situation where in the in the organization of the the client there's, there's some protocols in place for them to get data Okay, because another that's another issue. Data has to do with compliance and everything. So because of the compliances and all that, and uh, they're looking at okay, so we can pass the data on to you, or we can give you access to the data source, but we can but we can only give it to just one of you who needs to sign some agreement, you know, that they won't share, you know, those GDPR laws and everything. I know that these are dependents that affect you just working straight on, on a story. And that makes you give that, that that story a higher estimation because of that. I've spoken about size. Size is the same thing as volume. And just look at the example of the login and the registration, the volume of what you need to do, what you need to develop, what you need to test on, uh, on a registration uh, story is different from what you need to test when it comes to um what is it called a login story okay so the size also that determines also the the estimation that you put on that story and then you're looking at the, the the domain knowledge what is the domain knowledge of the person that is carrying out that estimation you know the domain knowledge of uh, um an experienced um uh, how will i put it an experienced team member developer or tester is different from the domain knowledge of somebody that is uh less experience i'll give you another example um i might let's assume daniel is um is uh is a developer with five years experience as a as a full full stack or either front end or back end developer and then vivian is another developer with um uh, an eight years experience they're both working in the same organization but Vivian has been working in this organization for the past six years, okay? And Daniel, who has 15 years experience as a developer, is has come on to work on that organization and is just coming in, you know, as a new developer. And they want to estimate. Um, Vivian's estimation will be lower than Daniel's estimation. Who can tell me why? Anyone? Yeah. Okay, because Vision has gained experience through what she has done before and she's able to work better because she has gone through the process, made her mistake, corrected herself, gained more knowledge. Thank you. Because you know, Vivian has been working there for the past six years. So she has the domain knowledge. She has some knowledge about how the system of the organization works and all that, even though when it comes to her overall um, um, experience as a developer, she just had eight years. However, Daniel is coming in with his 15 years experience as a developer. He's just coming into the organization, okay? So he still needs to learn their domain knowledge, have a knowledge of how their system works, how things work and all that. And that would affect his um, estimation. So you won't be looking at, oh, but he has 15 years experience. So why is he, uh, you know, estimating higher? It's because he's just founding himself in that organization, in that domain. He has not experienced their domain before until he goes through, like, um, I think it's Vivian that I explained now, until he goes through, you know, all those um, um, ex um, being on the platform, on the environment, actually testing and everything and all that, then he's able to bring his 15 years worth of experience and skills in and they'll be able to do better going forward, okay? So that also affects your estimation, okay? All right, so we want to look at the roles of the Scrum Master during estimation. What exactly do you do as a Scrum Master? during estimation. Okay, so as a Scrum Master, we know that you facilitate the meeting. Okay, so one of the, the, the key thing you do during the uh, during the estimation process, which is part of your sprint, uh, of your sprint planning or at times your refinement um, meeting is that you estimate. Okay, uh, sorry, you facilitate that meeting. You facilitate that process. The estimation process you facilitate it you ensure that it is conducted in an effective and collaborative way okay not just one person saying it's not just one person you know determining the number 
that all that team members should have, not just one person, you know, um, talking, everybody is a voice and you want to facilitate that. You want to ensure that that is being done. You know, that you, you may help your team member to um, not, you, you won't tell them the, the technique to, to pick, okay? You can decide to say, oh, we'll be running our estimation, you know, on planning poker and everything, ensure that everybody has enough access to it. Everybody understands the process and their role, you know, during that during that estimation process. We're able to do that. And then you encourage participation, okay? You encourage participation. You make sure everybody, like I said, everybody's, everybody that is meant to be part of it, a part of it. So you have about five developers and two testers, and four of your developers have uh, voted. The two developers have voted, and one has not voted. You won't decide that oh, it's just one. Let's just, let's just go ahead. No. You will call out to that person. Okay, we're waiting for your estimation now. We've noticed you've now estimated and everything. Okay, so uh, can you estimate, please, so that we can um um reveal and all that you encourage that person that person might be timid maybe because they've just joined the team and you know they don't want to embarrass themselves and everything and all that but that's that's part of why you're there you encourage them to to be able to be part of it because everyone has an equal opportunity to contribute to that discussion to contribute to the voting to be able to give their own viewpoints because that's the way they will grow and you need to be able to encourage them to be able to do that another thing you do is that you ensure okay that they share the understanding okay everybody has an understanding of what is going like i said earlier on they understand the story because if they understand the story then it would it's a, it's a big step into them being able to um estimate properly and even if you know during when they're right reading the story and you were refining the story and all that you would have asked all those questions and everything when it comes to estimation a, a, a new thought can pop up on somebody's head to say okay sorry why well, we just want to estimate that this just came up to me that i need clarification for that one are we saying that in those that story we need to do, 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 do you won't shut that person up to say oh we've passed the the shared understanding aspect of things we've passed the refinement aspect of things we're in estimation now why are you asking a question again no you give them the right to talk you give them the right to voice that because that could actually help every other person that is estimating it might be a thought that didn't you know like i said it just pop up and it might help everybody that person can ask that question get that clarification from either the po or the ba that would affect every other person that wants to vote to say oh if that's the case then ah, i thought i was going to give it a three then it won't be a three because it's more work to do and everything and then i will give it a, a five Okay, so shared understanding doesn't stop with when the story has been read and you've asked the question, is everybody clear? Let's go to estimation and everything. Yes, when they want to estimate, like I said, if anything pops up, you allow it to go. You allow it to go because it's still part of shared understanding. Okay, and then another thing you do during that um, 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 process is that you manage conflict. Okay, so... <laughs> During estimation, you can have a conflict. You can have two members arguing. No, it's meant to be a three because you do it. And I'm saying it's meant to be a five because of da, 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 da. you won't allow them to keep going on and on and on and on and on. You're able to manage that aspect. There will be disagreements, you know, it will arise. But as a scrum master, you should be able to know how to manage that conflict and have the team, you know, to arrive at the consensus, you know, on the estimated. So it might be that, okay, so. Somebody has picked an eight now and it's uh, sorry, a three now. And they said, Oh, why have you picked a three and everything? And they say, Oh, because to me, we just need to do this and this. That's all. And the other person has picked the five and said, To me, I think we need to do more than that because the story says da 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 and we need to do that. So you need to manage it, you know, by facilitating that discussion between the two of them, that disagreement. You'll be able to facilitate it. You look at the root cause. You have to understand and look at the root cause. Why are they arguing? What what is the bone of contention? in this argument now and most times it might need you getting the PO or the BA back to say okay this bone of contention can you clarify it so because if you clarify it to say that okay for this story what the acceptance criteria is saying is da, 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 da. so it might be that that particular aspect is vague that's why you're having two different interpretations to it and uh, so they want to specifically say what it it means and that's why user stories have to be you know um properly understood and everything to knock off all those things again you know everybody has their own understanding and, and how they want to work and all that but you're able to manage the conflict properly you don't leave them to just keep on you know going on and on and on because if you do that you have other people uh 
um, also giving their opinions. And before you know it, that conflict will go out of hand. And from um, estimation process, you have a conflict resolution process in your hand. So you have to be able to manage disagreements, you know, properly during the estimation process and then be able to record estimation you know once they've said okay we've reached a consensus this is what it is and everything you put the number there you save it onto the 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 user story that is you recording the estimate because you're the one facilitating the meeting so those are some of the scrum master's um, responsibility you know during the um, sprint planning so we want to look at the role of the product owner or the business analysts have, have, have uh, what I've done is I've put them together because in most organizations or some organizations, you will have two of them and the two roles being carried out by one person. The PO is also the one that is carrying out the role of the business analyst or a situation where the PO is not at the sprint planning and has delegated um, the business analyst, you know, to be a voice for him or her. So you can have such situations. So what what other things they do during that um, process? So one of the things the PO or the BA do during that process is that they provide context, you know, to the user for the user story. They give clarity to it. They're responsible to, you know, look at the stories that has been estimated. You'll be able to clarify any requirement that is vague, any, any aspect of the acceptance criteria that the team members do not understand they are able to provide that clarity that they, they need. They're able to look at, okay, so the PO will be the one to look at the business value um, for that particular story. And knowing, looking at the business value determines the priority that is being given, you know, to that story. Um, they look at the business value for each of the story and help the team to understand the importance of the story. So if, it's a, if you have a story that is that has a priority two and you have another one that has a priority four definitely you know that um, the priority two takes priority over the one that is priority four so the be the, they're able to give the context really of that story the core of that story and you know the value it has and then another thing they do like i said is they provide clarity where there are questions they're able to provide clarity you know to questions that may be raised by the developer or the testers or anyone really at the meeting, they're able to, they are available there to provide those answers so that the team members, the development, you know, they're part of the developers anyway, but the tester and the software developer themselves are able to get, you know, additional information that gives them clarity and then everybody has a shared understanding of that particular story. Um, they're also able to determine the the the, the priority, like I've, 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 I've spoken about, of that particular story and that definitely helps with the prioritization. There are times when uh, the importance of a story also affects the estimation. I'll tell you why. So in the, where in the situation where the PO is saying that, okay, so for this particular study, we don't really need to work on it on time and everything and all that, the, the urgency of working on it and everything can affect the estimation also on it. We might give it a higher estimation because you know there's, there's an urgency for us to complete it. It's prioritized and we just need to work on it. Um, um, on time and everything. So these are the things that the PO or the business analyst do during the estimation process to be able to give the team understanding, you know, in relation to the priority, in relation to the scope of that story that helps them to be able to um, estimate it properly. Now we want to look at the developer. What is the role of the developer during the um, during the estimation process? So they are the ones that are carrying out the software development. They are the ones that are building you know, the feature or the functionality that needed to be built into that story. So they want to understand uh, the story in order for them to be able to accurately, you know, um, develop it the way it's meant to be developed, to be able to add the feature, integrate it properly into the website that they are working on. They want to know the, the, the uh, based on the acceptance criteria, what are the technical constraints, you know, that we might face, the complexity. So they are looking at, if you a user story, like, let's use for, let's say for example now, the, uh, the registration story. So the BA has written the story and the BA has said, okay, so the fields that are meant to be there are name, uh, first name, uh, last name, 
da, 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 da. the developer will be asking questions like in order for them to know where the con you know technical constraints are is there any mandatory field are they all just you know optional field and then they're able to give the second point is provide technical expertise so if the ba says yeah yeah, yeah just make it so just we don't want anything too complex you know and everything we want user to be able to just come on and be able to and then they're able to give their technical expertise to say if you don't make some field mandatory you're leaving your website open to easy attack. You know, they're able to give their technical expertise. And once they do that, and then the PO and the BA now can decide that, oh, okay, if that's the case and everything like that, well, let's do this and that. I'll give you an example. I have a website where um, the the password is just for you to put in uh, alphanumeric numbers and all that. And if you notice now, a lot of websites are asking for special characters. And that's because right now, maybe hackers are able to easily hack into any alphanumeric numbers and hack into um, organizations' websites. And that's why they're asking for special characters because it will take the hackers a while, I think, some few years for them to be able to pick that because you don't know the, the um, special character that somebody's going to use. You know, and most of them are asking for that now and everything. So based on um, exposure, based on experience, the developer is able to provide that technical expertise knowledge that would help the BA either to, you know, reverse the story in such a way that it adds better value, you know, and, and users are quite safe when they see that, knowing that, okay, so if they can't with this, even me, myself, you know, when I'm logging in into it, it's difficult for me and everything. So it will take, a, it gives you rest of mind as a user to be able to use their website and all that. And that's adding business value to them. Once they know that their users are um, quite comfortable, it meets their expectation. Okay. And another thing that the developer does is they actively participate during the actual estimation. They, they actually carry out the estimation based on, you know, the information they've gotten through the user story. So that's um, what the um, the developers do. And another thing that I didn't add there that they do is they collaborate with the team. You know, during the consensus, when you're doing the discussion and everything in order to reach a consensus for a particular, um, uh, what is it called, a particular story, they also collaborate with the team in order to get there. And lastly, we want to look at the tester. So what exactly do your testers do? Uh, when they are uh, during the estimation process, just like the developer also, they also understand, you know, the user story and they are able to provide testing input. So what the developer, the, the, the technical expertise that the developer is going to put in is quite different from what the, the tester is going to put in because they are, they are looking at the quality. So they'll be able to look at the user story and the acceptance criteria and saying that, okay, so when you mean this, uh, are you saying this and that? Because while I'm testing it, do you understand? I want to make sure that I'm testing and I'm doing the right thing, okay? They also participate in the actual estimation and then they collaborate with the team, just like um, the developer and every other team, uh, every other team members during that um, sprint planning uh, process, okay? So uh, we want to look at, sorry, I think I might have, okay, I did this twice. Sorry, bear with me, I'm just gonna move that on. And then we want to look at what, when do you carry out estimation in a sprint? When do you carry it out? You can carry it out during refinement. So when you're having your refinement meeting, you can actually estimate it. So like I've said earlier on, when you do when you do estimation during refinement, it helps you to break the story down in case it's big. So you don't wait until you get to spring planning, like I said earlier on, for you to do that. During your refinement meeting, you size up a story. You get clarification on the story and everything, and then you size it up, and then you're able to commit it. You know, you're able to commit it. So, so okay, so uh, for this story, uh, for this story, mm, we're able to do an eight and all that and everything. You size it up, you do it, you do your estimation during that. You might be wondering and asking me, so if we've done estimation during refinement, why are we estimating again during sprint planning? So you estimate again during sprint planning because there must have been some changes that have come into that into the story you're going to work on. There might be new stories that are added um, between the time you did your refinement meeting and the time you're meeting for your sprint planning. And as a result, you need to you know kind of do your um, estimation again 
if nothing come nothing new comes into it and all that you as a scrum master just to get confirmation will be asking them to say okay so we've done all this estimation during refinement meeting are we still okay with those refinement ba did we add anything to the story po have anything new been added to that story that has changed the scope from what it was when we're doing the refinement meeting that we want to think about now when we're doing the sprint planning before we commit into it and take it into the sprint. If there is, definitely you'll have to do your um, estimation again based on the, you would get information um, on that on that new changes that has come into it, get clarification on it, and then as a result, be able to work with it. You know also that there might be a story that you've done in the previous or your, in your previous sprint and you're coming to sprint planning and this new story that you're working on is a follow-on on that story but there was something you discovered while you were working on that previous story which um, you didn't discover before the uh, refinement meeting, okay? And then by the time you discover it during the, the sprint plan, you say, oh, do you know that this particular story that you were taking in, which is a follow-on of da -da 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 that I've worked on, I discovered that, and then you talk about your discovery. Uh, this, your discovery can be um, an update onto that story, which definitely will affect any story points that has been estimated on that story in order for you to, you know, kind of... We estimate that story again during sprint planning. So during your refinement meeting, you estimate, and also during your sprint planning, you carry out estimation again. So we want to look at the challenges. There are some challenges that has to do with estimation. Okay, so the first one of your challenge is an unclear uh, requirement. In a situation where you have an unclear requirement, where you don't have, you know, like I said, the either the acceptance criteria, there's some vague aspect of the generic aspect of the um, 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 acceptance criteria is not specific enough. I know that that is a, that's one of the challenges you have that would affect your estimation where you don't have that clarity, that shared understanding or that deep knowledge concerning that user story. You will have challenges when you're drawing your estimation. Another one you have is lack of team consensus, which I've talked about earlier on, where you don't unanimously agree and there is a disagreement of conflict that arises during that estimation process is another challenge. And this, like I said, is based on people's knowledge, people's experience, people's skills, and all that. And that affects things. And it's a challenge that you have. Another challenge that you might have is in a situation where you over or under um, estimate. Okay. So again, that is due to a level of experience. So if I'm coming in, like I've used the example of the man with the 15 years wealth of experience coming but it's just coming into a new project so it give it's giving it the buffer to say that okay because i'm just coming into i don't understand this domain i know i've never worked on this domain before and as a result even if i look at where i'm work coming from if you have a story like this definitely i will have given it a three but because i don't know the domain i'm working in i'm just coming in. i don't know how the system works or what their system is. I'm just going to learn all that. And as a result, I'm going to give it a five, you know? And maybe when he's working, now that he understands the domain, and maybe that was when he will say that, oh, I've had to really overcommit or overestimated that particular story. I should have stayed with the three and all that. But you won't blame that person for putting that buffer in, like I said, because, you know, that is their skills are there also. And you, you, you have your um experience also talking there so um an experienced person can under commit or can underestimate a particular story so these are some of the challenges you have until you have a better understanding and you've worked for some few sprints as a developer or a tester where you're able to be able to um um, estimate properly and even with that you don't you don't become pro in the estimation because you know you're working on a, an uncertain and complex environment okay and because of that that would definitely affect how you work it may either makes you overestimate or underestimate but definitely there's continuous improvement in place for the team so another challenge you have is time constraints Okay, so people are looking at, you have team members looking at time constraints. And because of time constraints, really, is how, where you, why you break down your stories. Because you know you have a limited, your, your sprint is time box to two weeks. 
Okay, so you don't want the story to be so big. Uh, if you keep having 13, 13, 13, 13 in all the things and everything, definitely you won't be able to finish that sprint because if you have 13, a lot of 13 stories and one team member is taking two stories, that means they are having 26 sto um, story points to work on. It might, one story point even enough is the one that will take them throughout the whole sprint. So you're looking at time constraints and you're not able to balance, okay, what? how do I... Um, balance the effort I put on the story, effort um, the the um, estimate in hours I put on my task based on the timeline of the project. That's another challenge in place. But like I said, they definitely with experience and continuous improvement that can, you know, that challenge can be looked into, challenge can be resolved, either resolved completely or being worked on as you go along. And then another constraint you have in place is complex and technical user story. You know, like I've explained earlier on, um, a, a, a business analyst is looking at business solution. So they are writing based on business solution. The the stakeholders spoke to me. The stakeholders said they want a, a, a table. Uh, they want us to develop a table with um, 10 legs. They want us to develop a table with uh, flying wings and all that. It takes the, the technical people, the developer and the testers to come back to say, this is not applicable. It's 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 easy to say it, you know, but it's not applicable. There are some things you can't put on the website. It's just not applicable. It's not going to work. It's going to break things. This feature that you want us to put in, for me to put this feature in, is going to break a lot of things. So we need to reach out to you know the the, the third party provider of that particular environment and say, can we work this in into things? And they can come back to say, oh, it's possible. They can come back that to say it's not possible. And then you go back to the stakeholders to say, okay, so we need to look at this feature. This your requirement. We need to look at it again because somehow it's not possible. I'll give you an example. You can use your card on Amazon, but there's no way you can link to your back account from Amazon. So if if uh, if users as a, if as a user I want ah uh, can't we put a thing in place where you know before I buy something I want to quickly through Amazon check my account to know that there's enough money there and then come back and buy. It's not possible. Your bank is not going to allow, um, um, they can allow payment through your card on Amazon, but they will not allow access to your bank account through Amazon. So it might be one thing that you want as a user, which is, you know, easy for you to be able to do what you need to do, but it's not going to be applicable because of some laws, comp some compliances, some regulations will not allow it. You know, your your, your bank is not going to allow that to go ahead that's just an example of some complex technical you know uh, complexities and technicalities you can have to some user stories based on the the requirements from the from the end users or the, their expectation okay so um those are some of the challenges that you know you have it's not limited to that but at least those are some of them that you have um over there Okay, so um, before we go into our exercise, that is the end of the brief, you know, explanation on estimation that I quickly want to talk about. Do we have any question at this point? Um, I'm just going to stop the recording and then I can record any questions that we have also. Thank you.